I'm always very thankful to come to have fellowship with all of you here. Um, and uh, I'm also always very grateful the worship leader will pray for me first, even before I come forward to be to, to minister to all of you. And it's very it's, it's very comforting and very encouraging. Because usually I have to be the one that sounds like a prayer is very burdensome. No? I basically say that I appreciate you know the worship leader usually that's a tradition of praying even before the preaching starts. And that is something that I, I appreciate. Uh, I want to turn your attention to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 7, to 8, verse. Alright? You have the Bible with you, Luke chapter 3, verse 7 to 18. If you found the page or the screen, please say aloud, yes. yes. <clears throat> Luke chapter 3, verse 7 to 18. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe, the axe is already at the roots of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they ask, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His renewing fork is in, the, in his hand to clear this threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John ex exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Okay. <coughs> No, that's what I usually do, right? <laughs> but, the flower, but the flower is beautiful, huh? It's not that I don't like the flower. Okay, let's see whether the, the, the cable can lead me to. Okay. Now, um, let's see what we have here, huh? Okay. Now, if I will ask you this question, um, oh yeah, huh? so I have to, to disturb Danny that, that for that. Uh, if I will ask you this question, when is the best day or time? For you to tidy your house, what would be your answer? You can give me a time, morning, evening, afternoon, or someone midnight, okay, we'll able to also. Or some of you say, oh, Sunday or Saturday, okay. Show, show, me, show, show me some answers. Morning. Morning. Huh? Chinese? Chinese, you, no, no, not Chinese. Before Chinese, you're right. Chinese, you cannot ready. Right, must be before, even before the Chinese, you eat. Everything must be done already, right? It's a tradition. Yeah, that's a good time. Some of you say morning. Why morning? Still got energy. <laughs> Evening almost there already, right? Battery flat already. Okay. What, uh, anyone else? What day or time? Before a guest come. Before a guest come, you are right. Okay. Why? Why is it? Why is? Why is the time before the guest come is the best time? Why? Why? Say again. Do want to look back? All right. I I echo what you say. Huh? Let's see. Because. You know the, 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 the best time to clean the house is actually before your friend comes. Right? Because that's the that's the time that you can clean the house is the, in the most efficient way. Right? Usually it takes one day, two hours, 15 minutes, finish already. Why? Because your friend is coming. And sometimes friends uh, they they don't tell you that they're coming, or they tell you they're coming, but they say they are nearby already. They don't they don't give you advance notice of two months. They'll tell you they are nearby, you know. It so happened I'm nearby, I want to come over. And sometimes pastors do that, you know. Just, just let you in on a secret. When pastors tell you that I want to come and visit you, and they say we are nearby, it's also it's almost always because if they tell you we're going to come and visit you, in, uh, you know, like uh, make a make a booking with you, an appointment with you, usually they will get an answer from you. The answer is no. So therefore, they will say it so happened I'm nearby. All right, but it's not so happened. <laughs> they purposely come nearby and say they are nearby. You know, I just want to, I tap out something. I just want to drop by and pass you something. 
right? It's because they want to visit you, and sometimes they get a bit of pushback from certain people, and therefore they say, it so happened I'm nearby. Right? There's nothing, nothing is <laughs> coincident. Right? But I always like it when friends are coming because that is the time that whether you like it or not, you are forced to clean your house. Because like what Brother Leslie said, you want to make sure your house is presentable. And I learned in the hard way, I realized that it seems that the tidiness or the level of tidiness of the house is tied to the identity of the wife. That is why when during the early days of my marriage, right, you know, I like to invite friends over. And sometimes, I, not most of the time, I don't announce to my wife first. So I will bring my friend, and the two of us will come in one car, and we'll just pop up in our house, and then my wife will just see, notice that, you know, I, I brought a friend home. You know, in front, she'll be very, ah, okay, wow, well, so nice to see you, you know. Behind, ah, <laughs> why you never tell me? You must give me a bit of notice so that I can go and clean the house first. And I realized that wives are like this because if the house is presentable, it looks good on the wife. I don't know why it only looks good on the wife, doesn't look, I think the husband doesn't care. <laughs> but the wife, you know, when the house is in order, it, is, it looks good on the wife. And so I learned it the hard way. Like. So nowadays, uh, I'll give my wife one month notice before I invite my friend to come. I'll make sure that she's okay, then okay. If not, she will say, okay, can, but you tidy your house, tidy the house up, since you are the one inviting the friend. But so sometimes, you know, all of us will agree that one of the best times is to, to, to clean the house before our friend comes, especially on the day itself. Because you are so pumped up, you know, and you are so motivated because your friend is coming ready. Right? So when your friend comes, they will say, wow, your house is so tidy, not like my house, you know. Wow, no dust. Actually, this only happened half, a, half an hour ago. <laughs> but but they, are, they like it. They say, your house is so cozy. Oh, you know, if only our house is as clean as yours. Then, you know, the, the wife of that, <laughs> you know, but they actually, they were cleaning the house only half an hour before the friend arrived. But the living room is like this, but the store looks like this. <laughs> Why? Because half an hour only, right? You cannot, you know, you cannot like, oh, okay, slowly enjoy that process of cleaning the house. Because everything must be fast and furious. So living room is like this, very presentable, okay? But the store room is like this. And no one needs to know what's happening, what is going on in the storeroom. Because the storeroom is sacred ground and no one can enter. That is why sometimes, you know, I, sometimes I, I realize this. Sometimes I bring my children to my friend's house, right? Wow, oh, everything very clean. Then suddenly one of my, my children, uh, the younger one, he will want to run up the stairs to upstairs. Uh. That is when my friend, who is usually very gentle, will shout out, Hey, don't go upstairs! And you know why, right? Because maybe the upstairs also look like this. But as long as what? As long as the living room is very presentable, that is good enough. But that is, that is very human nature because we always want to present our very best before other people. But what goes on behind the scene, we don't want to let people know because usually it's not very nice. And that is something that happens in the church as well. Because when we come to church, we want to make sure that we are presentable. We want to give our very best to the people. We want to have a very good image, especially as leaders of the church, right? You know, if pastor come to church, uh, wearing slippers, wearing, you know, like chakwe tiao, wearing the singlet, uh, people are like, huh? Pastors like that, one. You know, pastor come in, Oi, like that. You like not this kind of pastor? If I come in like this, uh, I think next week, next time you won't see me anymore in this church. Not welcome. So we want to present our very best before other people. I remember there was once, you know, this, this is my pastor friend who told me this. He said, there was once he was preaching a message, you know, a message about loving your wife. And then he was preaching this message passionately, with enthusiasm, trying to use his persuasion to tell people, hey, you must love your wives, which is very biblical. Okay? In, in the book of Ephesians, love your wives. And, the, and all the ladies say, Amen. Hey, all the ladies not here or not agreeable, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking on your behalf, you quiet. <laughs> and then as he told me this story, because as he was preaching, and he said, all the husbands, you must love your wives. And then suddenly, you know, in the midst of the sea of silence, as, as everyone was so fixated on what the, the pastor was preaching, suddenly there was a, a, a voice, you know, coming up, a very familiar voice to the, to the, the pastor. And the voice went the somewhere like this. Huh. Can you imagine this, you know? Because the wasp pastor was saying, love your wives. You, know, you must love your wife because the wife is the bone of your bones, your rib of your ribs. And then, huh. And then the pastor was like, hey, 
Sounds familiar. And he turned around to scan and see who is this person, the troublemaker that was trying to disturb. And lo and behold, it was his son. No, why would you do that? Why also want to be presentable, man? Right? He does, she doesn't want to make the husband lose face. Because the husband lose face, she also lose face. But the son doesn't care. As a young person, he doesn't care. Huh? Because in the house, the papa is not like that. It's very, it's a very real thing. And sometimes it's like this, you know. It's sometimes it's like uh, the papa will present himself as a loving husband to the to the to the to the to the, to the wife, and the children will be like, hmm, this one only when the, the the friends are around. When the friends are not around, not like that one. But the children doesn't don't say that, nah. But this very courageous son, the pastor kid, actually, huh, true, true story. I don't know what happened after that, okay? But basically, you can imagine how awkward and how embarrassing the, the pastor was. You can disagree with what the reaction of the child, but that says something about how, as a human, we usually bring out our very best before other people. But in our comfort zone, in our homes, in our outside the church building, we might not be as good as people think we are because we often focus on the external. Okay? I find it very difficult to walk around. Okay, like I stay here, very obedient okay, because of the cable. Um, so whether it is the house, you know, where we, we try to make sure that our living room is presentable and we don't care about how messy the, the storm is, or you know, we want to present our very best to other people in the church, in our workplace, in our school, but in our house we are monsters. That is very worse. We try to deal with, we want to focus so much on the external, which is good. Which is good to be present a, the, your very best before other people, which is good. But then the problem is a lot of times we focus so much on the external that we forget to deal with our internal. That is the problem. So what I'm saying here is you 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 wear your very best to the church to everywhere is good. It's very good. Because that reflects what is in your heart. But the problem is, you focus so much on that, you forget about what is really going on in your life and in your heart. And that is something that the Jews, during the time of John the Baptist, they had this kind of tendency to focus on the external as well. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, we read from the Gospel of Luke just now, but in the same, the same event was recorded in the other Gospels. And the Gospel of Matthew, it says that people went up to him, and the him is John the Baptist. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the uh, Jordan. You can imagine that it was a very big crowd that went out to John the Baptist. Why? Because they wanted to be baptized by him. So it was a big crowd. And you can imagine for a moment why these people were there. Were they there because they wanted to repent? We will see for a while. They, it is not because they wanted to repent. You realize that they was just there for because it was trendy. It was it was the popular thing to do. Okay? So in chapter 3 verse 7 that we read just now, John said to the cross, now the Gospel of Matthew, the, only, the, the, the author himself, Matthew, only recorded John speaking to the religious leaders, which we know are usually, were usually scolded by people like John the Baptist and Jesus. But here, Luke was saying that John said to the cross in general, coming out to be baptized by him. Now baptism was not something that was invented by John the Baptist. It was not something that was invented by Jesus Christ. This was something that was, even though this word was not used in the Old Testament, it was a very common ritual in the Old Testament. It was a kind of rites or ritual of cleansing, of purification. And people who wanted, who were Gentiles, who wanted to be God worshippers, they need to go through that purification, which is baptism. But they don't use the word baptism. Now the word baptism in, the, in, uh, in Greek is actually baptism, which is immerse. That's all. Alright, and during, during those days, it was not a religious word also. So you can say that the ship has baptizo. That means the ship has sunk, has immersed into the water. So baptizo is not a religious word. Of course, later on, you John the Baptist, and then you have Jesus coming in, and then baptism seemed to be a religious word. It was not. It was a word in the regular daily living that was being used, and it was being adopted into Christianity, that's all. So you had John the Baptist baptizing people and a lot of people kept went to him. Now I said before, it was a regular thing that was being done because people wanted to be cleansed. Because for the Jews, it was very important to see themselves as clean people. People who had right standing before God. Why? Because they were the chosen one and there were a lot of rituals, there were a lot of rules 
that will say that oh, because of this you are unclean so therefore you have to go through the cleansing so that you can be deemed clean so that you can, uh, you can join the Jewish community to worship God okay so that was the ritual cleansing it's very similar to baptism so when John went out to the Jordan River to baptize people it was not a new thing he was there to baptize people and people thought wow oh, you know go out go out and be cleansed externally to be washed so that I have a right standing before God but it's all external it's all external it's all ritual now if I ask this question if it's so common and you don't need John the Baptist to baptize people why is it that the crowds were rushing to him or you know just rushing to him to be baptized by him what was special about him and you read in verse 15 just now that many people thought that John the Baptist was possibly the Messiah that's why they went to him because they thought, wow, the king has come. The savior that the, the Old Testament God has promised has arrived. So we want to go out there to receive blessing from this man of God. So it became a trend. People were going out there. It, it, you can imagine that conversation going on, you know, among the people like, huh? You haven't been baptized by John the Baptist. Huh? You are staying in the cave. Is it? Let's all go out, out there to be baptized by, by this guy that seems to be the promised Messiah. But we know that he was not the promised Messiah. He was the promised messenger to announce that the king has arrived. So he was playing just a supporting role. The main guy has not come yet. Which later on he did say that, you know, there's this guy who is coming that will baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. Okay? But when John said, when the people came and they wanted to be baptized, right? And you see again, they were focusing on the external, right? So John said to them, the first thing he said to them is, you brood of vipers. Now viper is a snake, man. And snake in the Bible is usually associated with Satan. So basically, John was saying to them, you are children of the devil. And you imagine this, you know, you imagine the gravity of what he's saying here. Say for example, just now when Lenny was leading worship, right? Say for example. And halfway through, he said, since Reverend Lenny is here today, right? As we are worshiping the Lord, as the Holy Spirit is working among us, those of you who want to be ministered to, those of you, he said, many are, are hurt, many need healing, which is very important. You know, we don't pretend that we are all okay. We are not okay. We are all going through struggles in life. That is why we need Jesus. Can I hear an amen? Are you only three Christians here? Amen? amen. We need Jesus. And let's say, let me say, okay, those who need prayer come forward. So some of you say, oh, I need Jesus to minister to me. I need the Holy Spirit to work in my life. So come forward. Oh, and this, this pastor, Reverend Daddy, I heard that it's very nice. Come forward. And the first thing I say to this person is not God loves you. No. You are a children, you are a child of the devil. How would you feel? Very hurting, right? Already hurt, right? More hurt. <laughs> but that was what he said. This man of God said to the people, Oh, you come out to be baptized, huh? you are actually children of the devil. Who want you to flee from the coming wrath? What he's saying here is that now you come up here to be baptized. And this baptism is not just about external cleansing. This baptism signifies repentance. But they don't get it. So he's saying to them, Do you know what this thing is all about? Who, who warned you, you know, to escape from the coming wrath by coming out to be baptized and to signify repentance? Who warned you that? Because you are all wicked. He was not harsh. He was not being unfriendly and not pastoral. He was just saying, these people, they think, you know, they are children of God and therefore they can do whatever they want. They are wicked. Therefore, they are being called good of vipers. Then he continued by saying, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What, are these, what is he saying here? Because many of them will think, will take pride in their identity, in their heritage as descendants of Abraham. Because descendants of Abraham are the covenantal children of God. Right? So confirm they are children of God. They are accepted by God. But John the Baptist is saying here, don't think that just because you have Abraham as your father, therefore your standing before God is secure in spite of the wicked things that you have done. Are you with me? Because he said what? Because for I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. God doesn't need you. Don't think that well, God needs you so much. Uh, well, because you are drawn Abraham, no choice, no. Whatever you do, God, God, God has to accept you. No. God can throw you aside and say, hey, let me live up, let me change, let me convert these stones to become children of Abraham. So again, John was saying here, don't focus on the external. Just because your identity is that you are a, you are a physical descendant of Abraham that you can think that can, you can do whatever you want to do. 
I think it's the same thing for us as Christians. Many times in life, right, we think that as long as we come to church on Sunday, we give offering, better still, we serve in the church. Then when we leave this place on Sunday night, we can do whatever we want to do. We can, we can have this honest dealing in our business, we can backstab people in our workplace, we can just abuse our wife in the house. We think we can do that as long as we come to church. No. What we do out there beyond this church building matters to God. Can I hear a yes? That's why I always say, I said this before, I said, you know those days, right, in the 90s, right, one of the popular things in terms of car accessories is bumper sticker. I, I talked about this before. And later on, I realized that young adults are taking, are peeling off the bumper stickers from their, from their, uh, the, what do you call that? The rear, what's that? The rear screen, uh, the glass, okay? You know what I'm saying here. I asked them, why do you take this out? Oh, because I don't let people know I'm Christian. Why? Because the later I cut kill, uh, you know, I horn. Uh, people say, wow, Jesus is the for Christians like that one. So better don't put God to shame. What are we doing here? We are basically telling other people, we are telling God, God, when I'm an outsider, uh, I don't want to let people know that I'm your child, I'm your child. Because the things that I do, I'm ashamed of. If you're ashamed of that, don't do that. If you know that when you simply horn like that, you know, you get angry, and if people know that you are Christian and you do that, you put God to shame, then don't do that. That is why don't focus on the external, don't just focus on the religious, don't just focus on church matters, which is important. But what God is equally concerned about is when you live this place, how do you live your lives as Christians? Can I hear a yes? Don't focus only on external. That is why for John the Baptist, he said external is important. But the external that he wants to focus here is not the religious rituals. It's not the baptism per se, which are important. Mm-hmm. In the other one, you think that, oh, so Reverend Daniel said baptism is not important. No, that, that's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying that the more important thing is the fruit of your repentance. So what John was telling them is that, hey, hello, do you know what baptism means? It is not just clean, clean, cleansing your body to signify that you are clean before God. No. When you receive baptism, you are telling God, God, I'm sorry, I'm remorseful, I need to turn from my wicked ways. But that, was, that is not enough for John. Because John is saying, saying sorry is not enough. You must produce fruit. So is external important? Yes. But the external that John the Baptist was focusing on is not all these rituals. It's the fruit that can be seen. Why? Because we can do a lot of things. We can commit ourselves externally to God in doing all this religious stuff. We can, and we are very good at that. But we might not be focusing on our inside. So if our inside is good, if our inside is healthy, the external will be healthy. But if our external is good, not necessarily our internal is good. Are you following me? Because that is what we are good at. We are good at taking care of our living room, but our store room goes, yeah. Some of us, you know, we come to church day, week in, week out, but we know that we are struggling with sin. We know that we are in bondage. We say sorry to God. God, sorry, I watched pornography today. Eh? So sorry, I'm not going to do it again. Tomorrow, I do it again. God, I'm not going to gossip about other people. Tomorrow, I gossip again. What is this? Yes, we are weak. But we are too weak, right? We are too lenient with ourselves, isn't it? Are there fruits in our lives that is in keeping with repentance? You know, sometimes I go to churches, right? You know, I preach messages, hey, you know, the church must be united because Christ wants us to be one. And therefore, let's stop gossiping about one another. Let's stop backstabbing one another using our tongues. Then at the end of the service, right, I, I say, let us just spend this time to pray for ourselves. I say, God, sorry for my tongue. I've not been guarding my tongue. I've been using my tongue to hurt one another. And gossiping. Oh, the service was good. I thought the service was good. I thought. At the end of the service, you know, we go out for Makkah. As we sat at the market table, I thought I was talking to the members, man, the members start, started gossiping again. I was like, hello, were you at our service? That is how easy we are to just ease one side, going one side, go out one side. If we really, really take God seriously, if we really take His word seriously, then let our repentance produce fruit. We are always so easy 
getting stuck in that cycle of sexual sins, relational sins, and etc. We are so easy to fall because we only bother about our external. Sometimes when we think about repentance, right, and we think about characteristics of mature Christians, what do we think about? If I were to come to you and say, give me five characteristics of a good Christian. Give me five characteristics of a Christian that is potentially, that can be potentially a leader of the church. You might have different criteria, right? But let me tell you this. For the many leaders I talk to, they will tell me this. Oh, first of all, this person must be committed to serve in the church. Worship leader, self leader, these are all important. Eh? Okay, self leader, worship leader, you know, committed, never complain. Wow, good attitude, potential leader. Okay, second one, they will say, wow, every time prayer meeting, uh, they will come. Uh. Prayer meeting, to attend prayer meeting regularly is not easy, right? Come for service, okay, lah, you know, must do, ma. good Christian must do. Prayer meeting, optional, ma. yeah, I know prayer is important, but I really, I really go for Sunday service. Tick. <laughs> prayer, when I'm free. But then what the leader said, what if you see someone every time they come for prayer meeting, uh, they come early and they pray until they don't want to go home. Wow, got this kind of people no? wow, Good potentially. Right? These are the people that will see that they are good Christians, they are mature Christians, we're going to promote them as leaders. And sometimes, you know, when you talk about good Christians, right? Now and then you have people come on stage and they will give testimony of what I call spectacular repentance. They will say something like, uh, which is good, I'm not saying this, these things are not good, please don't misunderstand me. They say things like, for the past 20 years, I've been struggling with drugs. I've been going in and out of drug rehab for so many times, and my wife wanted to give up on me. But today, I want to say to you, and it's not me, I'm just giving an example here. <laughs> just role playing. But today, I just want to say to you that God has transformed my life. I've been clean, I've been clean from drugs for the past five years. Right? And everyone, hallelujah, praise God, glory to God, right? So encouraging, right? These are all spectacular repentance because it's so dramatic. And then to add drama, to add the dramatic flavor to the testimony, and the pastor will say, the wife will come forward and the children will come forward. Right? And happy family. That's the end of the story. And let's pray for that family. Okay. But after two, after that, no one cares about the family. So good testimony for a while, right? right? But who is supporting them is another thing. Let's say last Sunday, who was the chairperson last Sunday? Who was the worship leader? Mm-hmm. Leslie. Somehow I feel that I was saying hey, it's, it's like Leslie and Les, Leslie and Lenny and the take turn. <laughs> All right, maybe there are others. Huh? Okay. Now let's say last Sunday, right? So Leslie was elder Leslie was chairing the leading the worship, and then he said, okay, today I have a special guest who want to come and share a testimony in five minutes. So there's an ex drug addict came up and shared his things. Huh? Spectacular repentance. We thank God for that. Then this son, today, Lenny said, today no one wanted to come and share the testimony. So I just want to open this time. Anyone want to share testimony? All of us were, don't know what to say because we were thinking, but I don't have spectacular testimony. Last Sunday, uh, that testimony is uh, so spectacular, no? Wow, you know, 20 years drunk, uh, after that no more. For me, it's like, uh, what can I share? Oh, this week I never quarrel, quarrel with my wife. <laughs> that's, that's all. Right? Not so spectacular. Really. But then when, you see, when John the Baptist was rebuking the people, and he said, produce fruit, fruits of repentance. And then he said, the ex is at the root of the tree. And for the tree that does not bear fruit, fruit of repentance, huh, the tree will be chopped off, not enough, chopped off and thrown into the fire. Well, this one really, make sure that the tree dies, not only chopped off, thrown into the fire. Then the people panic, really. They were saying, they were asking John the Baptist, what? What should we do? It's a no part. You know, yes, what can I do? Because they're very scared. And sometimes humans are like this. Like, you need to scare them a bit. Not scared and won't repent. Huh? Humans are like this, right? That's why parents are the parents of young children, right? We're very good at threatening our children. Still do that, right? Huh? Okay, tonight no act one. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Because you don't know what to do already. Right? Say nice thing, they also cannot. Must. Say, okay, uh, you do that, uh, which is not good, uh, uh, but that's what we usually do. Factor of children. But it's very effective. Uh, okay. Having said that, jo- so they came to John and said, what they asked, what should we do? So there were three groups of people that asked the same question, what should we do? Because they were scared. 
am I that tree that is, uh, that is fruitless? They are asking themselves. So he, the crowd came to him and asked, what should we do? Look at the instruction that he gave them. Very down to earth. Nothing religious about it. Nothing churchy about it. It's something that you can do on a daily basis. Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Hello, this is fruit of repentance as defined by John the Baptist. Right? It's not even like, or if you you know if you are committed, if you are committing adultery, repent, which is important. Repent. But he, what he's saying here is a very simple, very common, very unspectacular repentance. If you have more, give to those who are in need. As simple as that. And then Luke is very interesting because he said after this, he said, even the tax collectors came to be baptized. He used that word, even. That means, huh? Tax collectors also came. Why? You know it for yourself. Because tax, like, tax collectors were notoriously known to be people who are greedy, heartless, merciless, and always try to take advantage of their own fellow Jews. That's tax collectors. Now, if you cannot com- comprehend how greedy this, these tax collectors are, think with me for a moment. Tax collectors are basically Jews that are being authorized, that were being authorized by the Roman government, the oppressors, to what? To collect tax from their own fellow Jews. But the thing is this, so how do they, how do they earn money out of this thing? So say for example, you are supposed to charge 10 ringgit from your fellow Jew as a tax. And this is what we call indirect tax. They are only authorized to collect indirect tax, which is GST, SST, sales tax. Means you buy something, service, uh, service tax or goods tax. So they can charge you for 10 ringgit. No, they are supposed to collect 10 ringgit from you for the loan government. But they can collect 1,000 ringgit from you, from you, and the 900 ringgit they get in pocket. They are, they are allowed to do that. And if you don't give them the 1,000 ringgit that they demand, they're going to get the soldiers to catch you and throw you into prison. Really, huh? Worst, the worst thing is this. Imagine a businessman bringing his merchandise from South Jerusalem all the way to Galilee, which is in the North of Palestine. There will be stations or booths along the way, the tax collection booths along the way, along every border. Every time they pass by a booth, they are supposed to pay the tax for the same goods that they are carrying. By the time they reach Galilee, they are getting bankrupt. Really. Imagine you know, for the Jews, they were being bullied by no one's business, by their fellow Jews, just because they are tax collectors. That is why Liu said, even the tax collectors came to be baptized. And they also ask, what should we do? So what did, what did John say? Don't collect any more than you are required to. Very simple, very unspectacular, full of repentance. Just don't be greedy. Collect what you need, collect what you're supposed to collect, that's it, period. John the Baptist didn't even say, repent and stop being a tax collector. He didn't even say that. You continue to be a tax collector, but you'll be a Christian, good tax collector. Why? Because you need light in darkness. You don't need light in light, right? You need light in darkness. So tax collection is a very dark place. You need people who are Christians, who are whole Christian values to be there to bring light. I remember in uh, uh, YB, uh, Hannah Yeo's book, right? He, uh, she, she, she wrote a book, right? And then she, she said, during those days when she, she was about to become a politician, there time not many politicians, Christian politicians, so she went to ask a, a pastor that she respected. She respects, it sounds like past tense. She respects. And she, she, want, she asked for advice, saying that, I want to join, the politi- to join politics. What is your opinion? As a Christian, what is your opinion? As a, no, I mean, as a pastor, what is your opinion about Christian joining politics? So the pastor discouraged her and said, this is a dirty place, don't go there. But thank God she went. Because why? Darkness needs light. And then here now you have more and more Christians joining politi- politics, not to take over politics, but in the political arena, arena you shine for Christ. Can I hear yes? Same thing, whether you are a retiree, whether you are working or you are a student, wherever, wherever we are, we produce fruits of unspectacular repentance. Why unspectacular? Because it's a daily thing. 
It's an ordinary thing. It's, it's something that you, you do on a regular basis. But this is something that John the Baptist requires, or God spoke to John the Baptist. That, that is the definition of fruit of repentance. Not necessarily have to be churchy, spiritual, religious. It should be something that is happening in your life, in your daily living. And then the soldiers came to him, same question, what should we do? Again, very simple, very down-to-earth instruction. Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Why? Because during those days, the soldiers were abusing their authority and intimidating people, accusing people falsely so that they can get money out of the people. So the solution is what? The solution is not, it's not running away from being a soldier, but to be content with your pain. That means don't be greedy. You, have you heard of this argument? Uh, you know, people say that, um, why is it that the police, there's this bribery culture among the police in Malaysia. So some people say, it's because their salary is low. If you up their salary, they won't bribe, or they won't receive bribery. But you know this is not the solution, because you know what happened to one FDP? Greed knows no bound. It's not because your salary, you up the person's salary, then the person will stop being greedy. If a person wants to be greedy, even if the person is rich, the person will be greedy. So John the Baptist said, whatever salary you have, be content. And don't abuse your authority. Use your authority to bless other people. So you have it here, these three instructions to the three different groups. Unspectacular. But you realize that the fruit of repentance is always connected to other people. Because our faith is not an individualistic faith. No one can come to you and say, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to go to church. No one can say that. If you say that, you are not. You don't understand your faith. Because when you are a Christian, you are joined to the body of Christ. You are joined into the family of God. You are not alone. So anyone who says, I just need to watch YouTube, I worship God better, the sermon better than Reverend Daniel's one. Maybe. But that's not for a reason for you not to join church life, community life. Because our faith is always a communal faith. In the same way, our faith should always be outwardly blessing other people. So you see here the repentance here? The, 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 the common denominator is it must be, you must become a blessing to other people in your daily living. Are you with me? Yes? That is why I'm saying here, don't need whenever, only when someone has a spectacular repentance, then only someone can come on stage and say, can share testimony. Anyone can share a testimony. Because repentance does not need to be spectacular. So I, this is my dream. My dream is not necessarily every Sunday you have someone who is, you know, who has gone through a supernatural repentance that only deserve the right to come on stage and share. My dream is after the service every Sunday or even in your prayer meetings and etc., we can share about our testimonies of unspectacular repentance with one another. For example, after the service. One of you will come to uh, go to another person and say, I'm really happy because this week uh, is the first time I say to my papa, I love you. Ask for technical repentance. And someone said, For the first time in my life, uh, I, you know, I I hug my wife. Unspectacular un repentance. But it is fruit of repentance nonetheless. You see, when you see that, that is why it's very important here for us. The message we're going to bring home is this. God cares about your daily living. God cares about how you become a blessing for other people. Because these things that you are doing, acts of kindness, acts of justice, acts of compassion, these are fruits of repentance. Last, uh, last month, at the beginning of last month, I was, uh, I was in Desaru, okay? Enjoying myself because I was preaching at a camp, a family camp organized by Joyful Grace on the end. Now, if you know Joyful Grace, Presbyterian Church, huh? uh, they have an English church and they have a Chinese church, right? So for the past three years, the English church have been organizing a family camp, inviting the Chinese church to join, which is good. You know, we should have more of this inter, uh, uh, inter uh, linguistic gathering. So we went to Korat uh, Desaru, and this, this camp uh, is very chunky, very high-end, a lot of very sophisticated activities, which of course is good and enjoyable. Uh, first night, when we reached there, right, first night, uh, we reached there in the afternoon. So I preached at the first session at 4 o'clock. At night, uh, immediately, well, one of the highlights is to go and, sweep, uh, go and go on a boat ride to see fireflies. 
How many of you have seen fireflies fly? Wah, oh, not bad lah. Macam orang kaya. You, you know why I ask this? Because when I went there, I asked I asked a lot of these elderly people, you know, Joy of Grace, most of them have never seen a single firefly before. It's, I find it very amazing, you know, like, they are already in their 16 and 70s, they have never seen. Our children, 6, 7 years old, already see. Different generation, right? But having said that, you know, so we all went on the boat, uh, and uh, there was a boatman, right? There was a boatman, there was also a guy in charge of like coordinating and making sure, ah, okay, you sit here, sit there, ah, you're a bit too heavy, you sit this side, so that there's you know, a bit of balance. Uh, two things he told us. First thing, don't talk. Because you make noise, huh? later the, you know, the fireflies get disturbed, they go away. Second thing, don't take out your phone and take, you know, on your touch line. Because it will disturb the ecosystem. Oh, you know, very sophisticated. The, na- the nature here, because in Malaysia, actually, he, he mentioned to us there were like 13, 14 spots huh, you can go and see fireflies, but now it's down, down to 9 or 7. So we were, wow, you know, we were like Sunday school, you know, kindergarten students sitting there very quiet. Okay, 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 okay look, out for, look out for fireflies. And very quiet because you don't want to disturb the fireflies. After 5 minutes, uh, this guy who told us not to speak, he took the microphone. And start talking. Say, ah, okay, this place, ah. I was like, ah. Oh, so I speak, the, the, the fireflies will be disturbed. You speak, no problem. Huh? The, the fireflies are accustomed to your voice, is it? It's a double standard, but anyway, right? If you have gone through this, gone for this boat right before, you will know that there are sometimes uh, at certain trees, right? You will only see two or three fireflies, very few. So few that you don't even recognize their presence. But if you come across a tree where there are so many fireflies, it looks exactly like a Christmas tree, exactly, a very experienced. The whole tree is lit up because of the presence of the fireflies. Okay, now nothing spectacular happened to the to that the boat ride. But I want to use this as an analogy, analogy because and, um, a lot of times when we leave this place, right, and we think that ah, only in the church that I need need to show fruits of repentance. I need to talk nicely to one another. But when I go back home, go to my workplace, go to my park, go to my school, ah, I don't need to be a Christian because no one knows I'm Christian. Then, if moi is a tree, then moi is like a tree that have only a few fireflies lighting up that place that you don't even recognize that there are fireflies on that tree. But if every one of us, we recognize that fruit of repentance starts from your home, start from your workplace, start from your school, then it's very different. And when you step out from this place, you make sure that your backside lit up because, because you know that you are supposed to go out there to display fruit of repentance. Then, if every one of us, very small little firefly, will do our part in shining for Christ, then the whole world will be lit up and people will know that there is a church People will know that Christians are like this. They are loving, they are kind, because they are showing fruits of repentance. Can I hear a yes? Yes. yes? But nowadays, some people see Christians, they are like, they are not, oh, Christians are like that. They are like, huh, Christians are like that. And most of them don't even bother that there's a church. They just go on with their daily living. So we are staying, we are, we are stuck, you know, we are, we, are, we are confined in this place, and then we think that, oh, this is the place for me to light up for Christ. No, this is the place for you to like for Christ. You need to like for Christ here, but the more important place is in darkness. Can we like up more for Christ? Yes? <coughs> Repentance happens in our daily living. I just want to end with a story here. So many stories. Um, you know, in the early church, right? In the first few hundred years after Christ has uh, after the Pentecost, which is the day that the, the church was born, um, Christians, you know, were being ridiculed by other people. And there was this historian who was not a Christian, and we can still find his his, his historical writings today. And there was one in one in one you know one of the thing, the writings that he wrote. He wrote, Christians are a weird group of people. Now, why did he say that? Let me put this into context. Because there was, during those days, personal hygiene is something that was used often neglected because of the lack of uh, medical knowledge. 
There was no vaccine during those days. And now and then there will be a plague that will break out, like, like COVID like that. Okay? But during those days, it's fatal because, because there was no vaccine. So when a plague breaks out in the city, broke out in the city, people will run away from the city. Even the family members of the patients. Why? Because if I take care of the, my, my loved ones, I will also die. So many of these people, or all of these people, they will imagine this picture. They will rush out from the city gate, they will rush all the way out as far as possible from the city. Because the city is where the virus is. And it's spreading, it's spreading like no one's business. So this historian, who is a non, who, who is a non-Christian, he recorded, this bunch of Christians are very weird. Because everyone is running out from the city, but they are the only ones that are running into the city. Why? Because that is where the love of Christ is needed. The patients, they will lie down there, everyone has, has abandoned them because of their self-preservation. But there was a group of Christians, early church Christians, rushing into the city to take care of them. Were they like protected divinely so that you know God will protect them from the vi vi virus? No. Maybe, but not necessarily so. But nonetheless, they just rush into the city to take care of the people. And that is the fruit of repentance. Nowadays, you know, sometimes I tell people, hey, you want to go to Kota Tinggi, you know, the, you know, Ulai, to, you know, because there, there's a flood going on there, you know, December, a lot of flood going on. You want to go there and, you know, just uh, give out food or not. Even sometimes I ask young people, the one a pastor, very dirty, very muddy, I just pray for them. Hmm. Wonderful Christians. We want to be convenient. We don't want to be inconvenient. We don't want to be, okay. We don't want inconvenience to come upon us. But you look at the early church Christians, they are very different. They want to be in a state of inconvenience, not because they enjoy being inconvenient, in a state of inconvenience, but because they know what fruit, fruits of repentance look like. May we push ourselves out of our comfort zone. May we, in our daily living, be sensitive to the needs of other people. And really, show that fruit so that other people might know that Christ is love. Let us pray. God, you know that we are all busy. We are busy with different things. Even if we are free, we will occupy ourselves with things. But Lord, help us to align ourselves with your priorities. And you demonstrated to your son, Jesus Christ, by coming to this world, not to, just to enjoy your time in the temple or in the church, if there was one, but to live among the people in the streets. Because that is where people need Jesus. I pray for Emmanuel Moore. We will not be just confused contented with the programs in the church. We will not just be contented with the busyness in our life, but we will really look out for people who are in need. We will think about practical ways of being blessing to other people. Because that is what the fruit of repentance looks like. Lord, help us, because we are so complacent. Help us, Lord. Even myself, help us, O oh Lord. We are so complacent. We love convenience and comfort, Lord. For this week, Lord, help us, Lord. Show us how we can be a blessing to someone around us. Show us. So that when we come back to the church, we can share testimonies of unspectacular repentance to one another. Thank you, Father. May this church shine for you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us rise for the closing song.
Because this morning I was preaching at Kulai, and uh, this elder picked me from Kulai to Presbyterian Church, St. Cruz. Uh, she, in her prayer, she said a very powerful but simple statement, or simple but powerful statement. We are the church and not the building. When we leave this building, we remain the church. So let us receive God's blessing so that we can become a blessing to other people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace, both now and forever.